So welcome to all of you. Um, we are starting in a minute. We will let you settle in and arrive um, for this third webinar uh, we are organizing uh, in cooperation. Uh, three partners, uh, the Park for Sump project, uh, EPA, European Parking Association, and POLIS. Um, we are a lot of people today. Um, you have registered in large numbers, um, so we'll um, we have to give the the system Zoom uh, time to um, let you pass the uh, the registration gates. Okay, I will. Uh, We'll kick off now. I'm Ivo Kre from uh, Polis, and I'm uh, uh, chairing, uh, hosting this webinar together with Keith Williams uh, from uh, EPA. Um, today uh, it's, it's actually Nigel. Nigel, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Nigel. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, I saw Keith on the screen. I'm sorry, but you are also quite close to each other. He is my brother. So, yes, that's yeah. true. That's true. Good okay. start. Yeah, yeah. A um, couple of. Uh, uh, rules of the game uh, for the webinar. Um, we are a lot of people, so if you would have questions, uh, please do uh, put them in the chat. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, we also have asked the speakers to uh, to keep an eye on the chat and, and interact with you there. But the uh, um, the most pressing questions uh, we bring to the speakers. Uh, after each presentation, but also in a small panel discussion uh, at the end of each session. We are recording the webinar for people who can, cannot make it. Um, and uh, the recordings will be made available afterwards. Um, and we'll also provide you with a summary report as well as with the, uh, the downloads of the, uh, of the presentations that you will see uh, in the webinar. Um, so we have uh, two sessions. Um, and maybe Keith, uh, Nigel, sorry, now it's really imprinted. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Nigel, you can also uh, enter, enter the stage. In. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Um, we'll be talking uh, digital today, digital parking, and it's, uh, it's your, um, your world uh, yeah. mainly. Why is it important? Why do we have to be here today? Well, I think... Uh... I'm, I'm sure that parking um, and, and, and curbside management and sort of management of mobility services in, in you know, sort of the wider sense is increasingly uh, becoming a question of, of, of data technology, particularly payment systems. Um, and uh, it's uh, our, our subject digitization, parking ecosystem, equipment and devices as you know, we've had quite a few sessions trying to, 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 to come up with something that is, uh, um, is interesting and useful to, to, to the people uh, joining the webinar. I hope we've succeeded. Uh, we succeeded. We've, we've brought in for this first session four experts. Um, experts in, in this world are generally uh, linked to um, equipment suppliers or, or you know, they work for equipment suppliers or service uh, providers. Uh, we have asked them not to make them, you know, outrageous sales pitches, but to try and pull together something that is informative for, for everyone <coughs> so that we can uh, understand, you know, what you can, you know, what you can do with, with technology and data, because I think that's really what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. um, True. And in the second session, we look at uh, uh, two stories of cities who, have, uh, who are working on digital uh, Parking solutions, Sydney Class and Minds, uh, and we'll also hear about how uh, APDS can help with uh, with all these processes. So, um, uh, Nigel, I, I give you the floor, then I will disappear. You will manage the first uh, session, uh, and I uh, I let you deal with the speakers there. So Thank you very much. I'll stop Eva. sharing, also. Yep. Great. Yeah. Well, just before we hand over to the first speaker, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that there is a convergence between uh, um, what have traditionally been quite isolated aspects of parking management. That is you know, off street, on street, um, 
uh, and technology. The uh, um, and, and and today we've got we've got four speakers in this first session. Um, uh, one from the off-street world, essentially. One from the on-street world. One from uh, the the sort of payment services uh, provider. Uh, and 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 one who who worked for a long time for um, the the world of uh, um, sensors uh, to, to do with uh, you know, getting data about space occupancy. So uh, I think one of the things you're going to see, and it's been one of the problems we've actually had putting this uh, session together, is that because of this convergence, there tends to be an overlap between uh, the different uh, um, the different providers, the different um, sectors, and uh, what we've tried to do is make sure that uh, it's, it's not not too repetitious, but the, the what we're actually providing you with is some some information that is useful to you. Um, the uh, first uh, presentation is by Thomas Piringa from Ski Data, and Thomas is going to talk to us uh, about connected parking and mobility solutions. So, uh, Thomas, uh, if you're ready, over to you. Thank you, Nigel. So great honor for me to, to be able to open the session uh, and uh, let me just start sharing my screen. Crossing fingers, everything works with those digital tools. You should be able to see my screen now. So uh, I'm gonna talk about connected parking and mobility solutions uh, and the trends we're seeing from our perspective uh, as, as a predominantly off-street parking provider, Ski Data. Uh, so we talk about uh, welcoming the future of parking uh, which, uh, what is the future of parking anyway? So what, what we're seeing is, and, and, and this is showing a number of trends. I'm not gonna go through all of them because you're probably gonna be familiar with most of them anyway. Uh, but what we're observing is that uh, uh, this has uh, gained a lot of speed, the digitalization of parking and the new opportunities and the new challenges coming from it, specifically also in, in the, the urban uh, mobility space where, where people, the parkers themselves expect more connected uh, uh, solutions, expect things they can do in the, in the local grocery store, like paying with their mobile phone. Uh, and and uh, it's now about all bringing it together and making a reality. Uh, the things we've been talking about for the last 10 years, because like I said, not many new things here. Um, so what I do believe is that the future of parking has to be a lot more connected uh, 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 than today. Uh, simpler. Uh, I see still when you when you uh, stand in front of any any random parking and observe people, it's, it's surprising how many people still struggle with those those basic things of pulling down the window and getting the ticket in or out. Uh, it's not a convenient experience. We can make parking a lot simpler, but there's a risk with adding those new things in to, that it could get even more complex for users, and we have to really really think how we can avoid that. I, I personally believe. Also security, there's a new dimension. The more, the more connected and, and exposed to the public internet those solutions are, the more security can become a threat, cybersecurity. Uh, and of course, sustainability is, is becoming a more and more important factor. Uh, how do I enable uh, electronic vehicles in, in my city? How do I get rid of all those paper waste from the paper tickets? Uh, to just name two examples. So when, when we look at the, 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 the uh, urban space, I see a couple of, of uh, new opportunities, things we can do better in, 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 in that sense. So uh, I think one aspect is helping parkers and making sure they get guided to available parkings as fastly as possible. So not having to circle around for half an hour on the streets to, to try and desperately find one of those cheaper on-street parking slots uh, uh, and just know immediately where to go and park. Um, also making access to parking much simpler. Uh, 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 there's new opportunities making it ticketless uh, with uh, license plate recognition, but also other uh, ways to connect to, to a user's device and, and, and make it just much simpler. Uh, EV charging, like I mentioned, is becoming a big topic. How do I not only get into the city, but also make sure I can actually get out of it because my car is charged. Um, and then uh, I think one, one big topic is how can we can we, you and we incentivize the right behaviors, uh, uh, make it attractive to, to do and use park and ride concepts, uh, combine on street and off street. So, so make also off street parkings available to on street parkers and, and manage it in a combined way. Uh, 
and uh, in, in incentivize public use of public transports and also uh, apply inner city road tolling uh, where it makes sense. Payment I've mentioned, uh, I expect that it's gonna become a standard to be able to pay via the mobile phone, uh, not only in front of an APM, but also independently of, of APMs. Um, and we just need to make, increase the convenience for regular parkers that are in the city more often, in a certain place more often, uh, by, apply, by enabling pay-per-use concepts and making it really simple to just drive in by license plate, drive out by license plate, get the bill afterwards automatically, not having to do anything. Uh, and just to go into one of those details, license plate recognition has now become uh, to, to a quality level and a reliability level that uh, uh, we see customers and cities start to, to uh, use them for standard parkers. So not only for the registered parkers, but also for uh, uh, anonymous parkers, drive up uh, uh, users. So that in the future, you may see more like uh, uh, personalized big information displays at the entry lanes and, and of course cameras and other sensors uh, in there may or may not be a barrier. So in, in, in North of Europe, we already see a trend of of barriers being removed, uh, which makes it even simpler for the, for the end user. Of course, brings new challenges for operating such a business, but it's becoming possible technologies at that point now. Uh, same for, for payment, uh, uh, having to queue up or locate that, that payment machine somewhere in that big area of, that some of those parkings can be, uh, can be much more convenient to just go to the car pay uh, uh, via your own mobile phone by scanning a QR code on the ticket, or if there's no ticket, by just punching in your license plate number and then drive out. Uh, that uh, uh, could improve things quite a bit. Having said though, uh, I think it's important in the next years to offer both options to users. There will be in many situations, uh, uh, elderly news uh, customers or tourists that don't have the right uh, methods with them or they're not used to it. So how in this transition phase, I think it's important to offer the right balance of digital payment and booking options, but also still uh, uh, enable uh, uh, standard used ways of paying for the for the uh, certain group of users. And uh, uh, one important area is to enable new things. So not just talk about access anymore in parking, uh, e-charging is becoming an extremely important uh, thing. And again, here, how, I think we have to all think, how can we make uh, an, an e-vehicle parkers drive uh, uh, life easier by not having to download yet another app, register again, uh, uh, pay two different parts of the parking experience. Uh, and and uh, the same goes for park and ride concepts. Uh, the last mile, how can you just use your transportation ticket for for parking or vice versa, use your parking tickets to, to go uh, with public transport. Uh, and again, uh, how can we uh, get those on-street and, and off-street uh, parking worlds closer together or ideally completely together by having uh, jointly managed tariffs, uh, uh, same user base, uh, joint reports, so we can actually make the right decisions uh, uh, by managing those two worlds together. Uh, another thing is, like I mentioned, just uh, managing all those things. Uh, uh, how can you smartly use those new possibilities to, to also transition to a world where uh, uh, you don't need a call center or, or control center uh, whose people's job is to answer and react on incidents? Uh, if there's actually no barriers and, and payment happens asynchronously, digitally, service and support might be a completely different job in the future uh, and you might need completely different tools so how can you use make use uh, a smart use of artificial intelligence centralized reporting and and all those other automation possibilities in a smart way to make your own life and also your partner's life uh, easier and better uh, in, to do that i think it's important that uh, in, in parking also the individual parts of the solution the different systems talk together better in, 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 in new ways. So an open interface architecture to exchange information between the systems uh, and uh, eliminate need for manual interactions by the user or the operator, uh, I think is extremely important. 
uh, and end applying self-learning systems so that you can automatically identify patterns of your users, things that happen more frequently and automate things other than doing everything manual and copy information and, and, and configurations between multiple systems that can be quite annoying. And same goes for the user. Um, uh, the user expects that, uh, uh, that they can do uh, ideally everything with one or no registration. So having to download an app for on street and another app for off street and another app for transportation, that at some point is getting really, really annoying. So how can we, how can we help users uh, uh, have a really seamless experience across all those channels uh, and being able to use the payment methods they've already configured on their phone, being able to, to do uh, things uh, uh, in, in a very easy way as they're used to from other services in, in other businesses. Because let's not forget what Google does, what Amazon does, what all what happens around us, what Apple Pay enables, they can use in all the other uh, uh, experiences in your city. So they expect the same to be able to do uh, in, in, in parking. Uh, who, who still wants to have a, a bag full of coins to be able to pay for your parking. Nobody really, I think, these days. Uh, so, and what we're seeing is that uh, all those things that we've talked about uh, for in the last 10 years are now becoming a reality in more and more cities and areas. So we have uh, a, a customer, BNB, they, they have uh, uh, 54 car parks in 30 cities and they've, they're gradually switching their car parks to ticketless parking. So there's no more tickets. And even anonymous parkers just drive up, the license plate is red, they're let in, and then on the payment machine, they punch in their license plate, they pay in the same way they go out. Uh, no more tickets. Uh, that's a huge change. And, and they've also centralized their operations uh, uh, in a great way. And in the northern uh, uh, area of Europe and in, in Norway and other countries there, we see a huge trend already where there's no more barriers in parkings. Uh, so uh, what you see is a big display that tells you, yes, your license plate was read correctly. You're welcome to park here. And at the exit, there's a similar display that says goodbye. Don't forget to pay within 48 hours because users don't even have to pay before they exit. They go back home, they pay afterwards. Uh, and even additionally, they've integrated uh, uh, with, with Easy Park and on-street parking apps. So you can use the same app that you use to park on-street to park in those free flow uh, uh, parkings uh, and not having to do anything. Uh, money just gets deducted from your account. How convenient is that? And another example is the city of Amsterdam who have started many, many years ago to, to, to bring those worlds much more together. They have probably the, one of the most advanced park and ride concepts uh, in, in, of European cities. They've integrated multiple apps and they've done an interesting thing also. They, 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 they've started managing on street and off street together. And, and for good reasons, it's, it's in many areas of the city more expensive to park on the street than to park off street. Talk about incentivation. Uh, uh, people will no longer are, are no longer circling around to find that cheaper on-street parking uh, spot because it's not cheaper. So, uh, it, and I think that's that's a great uh, bold step that they've taken there. And that's it. That's just a quick overview of, of the new possibilities, new new ideas, uh, and, and things we're we're seeing. Uh, very much looking forward uh, to to any questions. Hi. Uh, I'm back. Right. Uh, trouble getting in. Thank you very much uh, for that, Thomas. I mean, there was a lot in there. Um, as I said at the beginning, it's quite a complex uh, uh, subject that we're trying to cover here in a couple of hours. Uh, we do have um, uh, a few questions. I think we have four. Um, uh, Evo, shall we? We'll, we'll, we'll take a couple of those now. Yeah. Um, not sure how yeah. you want to deal with yeah Archie there's now. only one real real question i think uh the uh the one that i see um there's an uh a comment uh of andrew luck who says uh, uh basically says for their context the uk uh, of course technology there's a lot possible but there's always uh legal barriers or um so maybe you can reflect a bit on that question like how how do you see that uh, the fact that uh, there's a, a lot possible in uh, um, in terms of technology, but yeah. that there might be uh, legal or um, 
organizational yeah, that's, issues. Kind of, yep. you could look at that. Um, the kind of big data connectivity trends are are counter uh, uh, count, being countered by data protection laws uh, that are, are are changing and evolving. Uh, so the, those two trends are not making each other's life easy sometimes. But we do see also that uh, uh, that uh, uh, countries are changing their legislations and making things possible. It's been very difficult, like to to have uh, uh, license plate recognition because of. The, uh, uh, data regulations to even capture the license plate that has changed in many countries. Uh, and then the, the other issue is, uh, can you actually uh, get a hold of somebody who paid and drove out of your car park afterwards if he doesn't pay? In the Nordics, that's easily possible. In Germany, it's not also possible. Even in the US for, for government uh, 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 run uh, operations, it's possible, but uh, there are many gaps in Europe where it's not possible to have a true free flow solution. What you can do in the interim is, for instance, have a solution where there's no barrier at the entry, but there is a barrier at the exit. So that's almost, that's very close to it. Uh, it gives this freedom feeling and much simpler experience and then take the next steps as, as they become possible. Uh, yeah, I also, in the meantime, I also uh, looked at the, the q and I was only looking at the chat, apologies for that. Um, there's a couple of things, Thomas, you might want to uh, answer to also in writing, but I think that the big question is about license plate recognition, free flow, um, that uh, we are dealing really with systems that can be for the user and not for the um, for the company to collect data, to track customers. Um, so how do we deal with privacy issues um, surrounding that? If I, I can guess. step in yeah. just one yep. second, uh, Ivo. I mean, we uh, EPA with, uh, with the Alliance for Parking Data Standards is, is, is kicking off a, a, a project to look into the whole question of data privacy and how GDPR uh, should, could be uh applied to you know in the world of parking mm -hmm. um but i mean the the there is a as, as thomas has alluded to there are big differences in the national legislations uh as as to you know access to the 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 database uh of you know who owns which car um and uh, you know who who can access it and there are big differences in that and and how you can use that data i mean the uk is probably well it certainly has been the the one with the with the the um, easiest, shall I say, access to that information, and is actually rowing back from that in certain certain cases, which is what uh, uh, Andy is alluding to. So it is something that uh, that EPA uh, and hopefully we and Polis will will work with us on that to 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 try and get a bit more um, coherence across the the different uh, EU nations, both to in to, to allow easier access in some cases but make sure that people are protected that their data is protected um no, that's true we see we see markets moving at different speeds uh, so not everything that's technically possible is possible in each situation that's that's why it's always very important to look at the individualization uh, situation and, and look at the options and design it in a way that that makes most sense for the parkers for the business and of course is compliant with gpr and other rules Great. Well, look, thank you very much. I think we need to move on though, Evo. Um, it is. Yeah. So um, next up is uh, Thierry Brousseau from, uh, from Flubert. Um, uh, obviously here from uh, at least the starting point is, uh, is on-street parking and, and curbside management. Um, I'll uh, hand over to you, uh, Thierry. Thanks. Share my screen. No, no problem with this. Yeah, we can see the. Uh, you can, you the see my slide. Okay, you, you can see the first see slide. Yeah. Okay, so good. So I so I start with this. So the, the objective of, of this presentation uh, is to highlight uh, applied digital on street parking uh, solutions. Uh, I will illustrate uh, this by some results uh, of this uh, after the parking reform in France, because I know, I know quite well this, and we have a big bank in, in France uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, at the end, to demonstrate the direct application of, uh, of this uh, digital on-street parking solutions to curbside management. 
uh, just some word in, in France. Okay, the parking reform took place in 2018. And, uh, and since this parking reform, more than 90% of cities uh, have switched and deployed digital on street parking management. And as a, as a global result, the respect rate in France uh, has more than doubled in average in, uh, in, uh, in cities. And the congestion, so the parking congestion in, 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 uh, on street in cities are, are clearly dropped. So that uh, shows that it's, uh, it has a real effect on, uh, on, on the system. So first... Thierry, sorry yeah. to interrupt. It's probably worth saying that it was the it was the decriminalization, yes, wasn't it? Yeah, parking yeah, French, enforcement French, was the reform. French, yeah. French parking is decriminalization and decentralization. So each city is, uh, set up their own uh, policy, and uh, and the efficiency uh, of of uh, enforcement uh, is key. And uh, and the services uh, bring by by uh, by digital uh, digital parking uh, help to do this. It's not only uh, it's not only a technical things. Uh, it's that the technology uh, with the with this uh, with this uh, low evolution uh, allows to have to have something more more efficient. Um, first, for, for for the user, for for the user, the digitization of uh, of on street offers better information and more differentiated tariff, depending on geo based. Sorry, for this I did not get. Depending on geo based uh, regulation and user of vehicle types. So uh, one of the interests is to is to be able to have differentiated tariff depending on where you are. Uh, and who you are, uh, what, what type of car do you use? Are you a resident? Are you a professional? Uh, and all of this is uh, more easy to, 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 to make with, uh, with, uh, with digital parking because we come back on license plate uh, on the on street digital system. Uh, it's based on, on license plate and you can be registered uh, with your license plate uh, or by directly entry your license plate number into a parking terminals or because you have registered your license plate uh, and uh, and you use a mobile payment or, 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 or system like that and the ticket becomes a digital uh, tickets and so for the users they know there's no need to go back on this car to display the tickets one of main interests also of of digitization is uh, this allow deployment of Omnichannel, so omnichannel in the term of uh, uh, all channels. So it's it's it's, it's multi-channel, but it's a capacity to integrate all kind of channels. Uh, it could be uh, it could be parking terminals uh, as today, with uh, with the evolution of parking terminals to have them becoming more digital, with a large screen, color screen, extended keyboards, or, or touch screen for uh, for the, the the new ones uh, to uh, to use mobile apps, so different kinds of mobile apps. Uh, websites uh, still keep office attendant uh, for registration of resident or, or things like that. And also uh, coming more and more, it's in the continuation of uh, mobile apps to have in-car systems. So to have directly your, uh, your equivalent of applications directly on board in your, in your car. And what, what is important also is means of payment. Uh, means of payment depending on all these channels. So Interest is to be able to offer all means of payment. Uh, it could be uh, okay, credit cards, uh, online accounts, but also coins, uh, which is still a, still a, a universal payment. And uh, with digitization, if you offer all this minimum payment all sales channel, you have a real accessible and inclusive system. Uh, each uh, users can just select the best, the, the channel the best adapted to his needs. He is a frequent user or just occasional, he's a visitor. Uh, he wants to pay by credit card, by coin. He's, up, he's ready to open an account, give his license plate number, his credit card to an operator to have everything automatic. So it opens all these kind of possibilities uh, that you don't have if you just stay in a simple uh, simple parking uh, parking system without any, uh, any recording of data and information. Uh, just to give also some, some link with, uh, with uh, France when we do this, uh, after the parking reforms, uh, if I go to the pay and display machines or the parking terminals, uh, more than 90% of parking terminals in France have been uh, retrofitted, so as they have been modified uh, to add color screen, extended keyboards or touch screen, so to become digital, or they have been replaced. So, uh, so it, it, 
It's a big change since 2018 uh, to, to, to have this. And uh, in uh, around two thirds of cities, uh, you have today one or more mobile payment uh, parking apps. So that's a good, a very big change uh, since, uh, this, since these reforms uh, and, and the interest of, uh, of cities to, to, to be more, uh, to, 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 for, for this, um, this say the digital solutions. On, uh, on, on the city side, the digital on-street parking management uh, give to the city IT tools and data uh, to define and control the use of the curbside side and to apply their uh, sustainable mobility and public space sharing policies. It's not only uh, uh, paid parking, it's also a sustainable mobility if you want to have mobile, mo model shift and uh, public space sharing possibility. Uh, I will come back on that, but uh, with all this new, uh, we said about EV charging, uh, uh, delivery space, uh, uh, all, all this new uh, mobility platform uh, uh, for car sharing, uh, scooter sharing, uh, all of this require access to, um, to, the, to the curb. Uh, and, and, and so this policy has to be taken into, into all. And to do this, to do this, uh, they have control on, uh, on, uh, on shared and allocated space. So the interest is to have a real mapping of all the curve side and to define wh what are the space shared between cars and, uh, and, and between scooter or between cars and, and, uh, and car sharing. What are the allocated space for a disabled, for delivery uh, um, and, and to put a regulation on all this space. Regulation, so map-based, so geolocalized regulation. Uh, in addition, uh, to have the regulation based on user and vehicle types. So what kind of user do, 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 we, uh, do we integrate? A resident, professional, different kind of professional uh, vehicle types could be uh, depending on, uh, on, their, uh, on their level of pollution or, or, or size. Uh, mobility mode, uh, take, have differentiation in uh, the type of mode you use because a car and a car sharing uh, is different, so to, to, you may apply different rights to car sharing, uh, car sharing uh, uh, things. So all of this has to be managed. Financial consolidation is important because you have multi, uh, as we said at the beginning, multi-channel and poss possibly multi-vendors, uh, different, different mobile phone operators, different operators or, or, or platform of mobility. We use the care and, and you have to, to, have a, to consolidate all this uh, financial or payment of, of, of this. And at the end, uh, monitoring analysis, uh, all the use, the actual usage. Uh, you, you get this by all the tickets, you get this by control, uh, by the respect rates, and to be able to, to have this, uh, this analytics to, share, to, 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 to verify the compliance uh, with the defined uh, policies and to have some also data to, to publish on open data. I implementation of this. You've got a couple of minutes, Thierry. Okay, yeah. just very quick on this. Uh, so the implementation of this is, is around a, a, a digital hub which connects to multiple channels, multi vendors, uh, and it requires a, a digital parking hubs. These digital parking hubs also require to, has to be connected to a control infrastructure to check the presence of electronic tickets uh, uh, for, for each car. You also may have connections to authorities, uh, for example, to go to the to access to um, vehicle registration certificate files uh, to to check uh, to check the type of uh, category of vehicle emission and to apply different tariff. You may also uh, connect to um, housing housing taxes to 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 verify uh, application for residents, and those access are are uh, authorized or not depending on countries. And uh, each city has its own environment. In France, to give a, a, an example, this kind of integration between multi-vendor uh, interface uh, uh, with, with all control, um, you, you had in France uh, around 500 cities making parking. Implementation have all been defined at, uh, at city level with integration one-to-one -one between all the different players. And uh, to give an example for, for uh, Flowbird, for, we, we are in 450 cities in France. We, we made 
around in terms of configuration of integration, nearly 200 different configuration because it's different players, different API, different uh, different standards. So that so this has been done at this uh, at this at this time, and it has been possible uh, possible because the digital parking exists for for quite a quite a long time. So all this uh, all this API, uh, some of them all already exist, and. Uh, and there is only one new thing in, in France that we had. It was uh, the FPS, or so the fine, the fine uh, uh, system, or the fine uh, process, where, which was completely new due to the law. And FNMS has set up uh, a standard, uh, API standard for, uh, for, uh, for, for for to manage uh, to manage the fines in France. And this standard has been adopted by all players. So this new system has been uh, quite easily integrated because uh, because of these standards. And uh, what is important here, it's uh, this allow to manage uh, to manage the the curb with, with digital parking, so for paid parking, and it's quite uh, easy and could be directly applied to manage all the use of the curb side. Uh, I put some figures. Okay, it could be uh, it could be uh, delivery or, or, or EVs and uh, and, and things like that. I, I speak about the use of the curb side. By geolocali geolocalizing uh, new regulations, I can say this space is specific for delivery. Uh, this is the regulation of delivery, and we integrate this in, in, in the system. And we interface, we have to interface also this parking hub uh, with the platform, uh, the operator, the platform or share mobility uh, solutions, or last mile, last mile delivery logistics. So there is already some project on all this integration. We have integration for uh, for uh, car sharing because it's quite it's quite easy. It's still still a car. We have, we 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 have some project in a, so in US for a delivery zone where in US they are ready to make a payment for uh, for delivery and we integrate some 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 um, the, the delivery into this uh, this system and, uh, and and already for uh, for payment of uh, of charging station in some area of the world also. Thierry, I'm going to have to cut you off, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I finish. So, uh, yeah. There so, um, there's, a, there's a couple of questions, though. That, so, one um, from Michel Arnd. Uh, do you know of any city deciding their parking tariff depending on real time parking pressure? So, basically, dynamic tariffs based you know, on, on, on the, the, the occupancy, if you like. Is that something would be interesting from a policy perspective? Do you, do you know of cities that are, are doing I, that? I, I, I know about uh, projects uh, made in uh, in uh, in US in in California on that. Um, okay, well, uh, after okay, it could be could be possible. Uh, at the end, at the end, the human uh, human being, you 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 take your car to to park, so you need to know before. Uh, and I know that there is different kind of projects. You have real time, or you have you have quite dynamic tariff. Yeah, but uh, I think it's really key for the driver to be informed before he takes he takes he, he takes his car uh, and go to the city. So it cannot be uh, at a second or at a minute, yeah. but you may adapt from one day to the other and 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 and, and inform user because they, they will have to change their plan. They cannot be uh, uh, just have a, a, a tariff when they arrive at destination. They put your, their car and they say, okay, it's double than I plan. It's a little bit too late. You will not change user behavior on that. So it's not a technical problem. It's more, uh, it's more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a communication problem. A communication isn't it? process and how to change behavior of people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I know, I know that, that uh, there's a couple of cities in uh, uh, in the UK that are looking at some version of that. But you're absolutely right. I think Tis Tis's question. Uh, uh was uh was to thomas but i think it also applies to your yourself are you looking interfacing with mass providers i think you answered that by yeah, saying yeah you are, i, I yeah? did not show okay, okay. my subject was cap sign management the, just to see mass provider uh, uh, as flobert we 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 are looking to to interface so we are part of several projects and uh, you may know that uh, also flobert is a, is a supplier of uh, uh, of, of public transport system ticketing, mm -hmm. and for example, the city uh, city uh, or principauté of Monaco, the mass system of uh, principauté of Monaco is made. Uh, it's called Mon Monapass. is made by Flaubert, and in it integrates parking on street, uh, public transport, uh, car, um, bicycle, uh, bike sharing system of the city, and we have planned to 
to, 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 to evaluate for off street parking integration also. So, so we made the application based on the Flowbird application to, to make a mass system, which come with on street parking and we add. So, so it's, a, it's an example of on street pa of parking, uh, parking apps integrating other solution to become a mass application. Great, thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, Ivo, if you're in agreement, there's a, there's a question that came from uh, um, someone uh, who's uh, from uh, Malaysia. Um, I think we'll deal with that at the end because it, it's slightly wider um, subject in the in the okay. uh, yes. sort of wrap up. Yeah. Yep. Um, and and the question about uh, payment infrastructure to other uh, modes. I think we've we've dealt with that, but I suspect that that's going to get picked up at least by Keith a bit later. So um, if everyone's in agreement, uh, right. Well, there were a couple more actually in the meantime. Um, what, what I'm thinking about this, you know, uh, Evo, I, I fear this would happen, that there's going to be a subject of uh, there's gonna be some really interesting questions. I think maybe we'll have to think about a sort of follow-up actually to pick up on some of these questions and deal with them in more detail. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and also the speakers can uh, inter answer live, uh, answer in, in, in writing, in writing. So uh, yeah. in parallel of what we'll discuss later, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Thierry. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so now uh, the, th the third presentation, uh, we're moving on to, to a presentation by, by Morten Sorensen from, uh, from Easy Park, um, which in a way, uh, as I was saying, you know, the, it's a demonstration, I think, of the, of the convergence that we're seeing between on-street and off-street uh, operations. So uh, uh, Morgan's going to give us an over Morton, sorry, Morgan's my uh, son-in-law. Morton's going to give us an overview of the parking ecosystem. So uh, Morton, if you're there, over to you. Come in, Morton. Here we go. Uh, I can see your screen, but I can't hear you. I don't know whether you're. No, I'm here. No, I'm uh, here. Just. Uh... You're just trying. You're just trying to raise my stress level, are you, Mort? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Over yeah, to yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, um, I would like to tag a little bit on what has been just presented. Maybe go a bit more into an operational uh, perspective for how to actually leverage uh, all the data that is being captured as part of the parking ecosystem. Um, let me see how I actually move this forward. Here we go. So the the point uh, of origin in this is basically that all our parking spaces, especially on street or on street, is basically being mismanaged. It's a huge asset, but no one really understands the nature of this asset and how to optimize this asset. And we can see that the key traits of having a mismanaged asset is that the, the actual leverage of the asset is very inefficient. We all know that a lot of the tariff designs, the zoning uh, and so forth, are actually sometimes are quite old and not based on data, but based on either political or practical um, purposes. So the city planning actually lacks a lot of data in order to optimize their parking assets. Not having optimized the parking assets from a demand perspective incurs high congestions. Because if you have an, a parking asset or inventory that is not optimized, people will not, you could say, behave or drive around in an optimized fashion, which again will give long search times and contribute to the pollution and the mobility of the city. So you can say overall, this is a matter of policy making for the cities, balancing parking supply against parking demand. So in order to understand how to influence the parking demand, you need to understand the nature of your asset. So 
if we zoom down on the parking asset on street, we will see a lot of rules being applied. Free parking areas, paid parking areas for disabled people, maybe high rotation areas with a certain number of limited, or limited numbers of uh, or minutes for parking. It could also be restricted areas with no uh, entrance and so forth. And as we speak, new areas are being added, car sharing, EV charging, and so forth. It's all adding to the complexity of the parking supply. On the other hand side, we have the demand. All the motorists, the citizens, the visitors of the city, and they just want to park their car again on with their life. However, the problem is that there's a high level of intransparency. And there's also, with that lack of transparency, you can say that the demand side and the supply side are not being balanced. It's increasingly, just to take one example, I think that is very present for some countries is that as the number of EVs are actually uh, booming, then it will be increasingly difficult to find a spot to charge your car. So this is a very, you can say, simple example of how the parking supply now in an EV context is not matching the parking demand. So what to do? Well, tagging along was, was, was um, in, in the presentation before, the parking ecosystem is actually uh, quite well structured. There's a demand side. These are what we today can see as being enabled, disabled, disabled people, motorists, families, and so forth. They will use a number of services as we've been through before. It can be camera parking. It can be to start and stop your parking automatically or semi-automatically in the car, permits and so forth. There are a number of ways to actually access the, <clears throat> the parking inventory. And the enablers for that are increasingly moving from the, from the paint display machines and into uh, mobile applications. All this data that is captured as part of these parking transactions are normally captured in a hub, a smart hub. And here I have to say that there are different beliefs in, in the hub construct. We believe that a hub needs to be, you can say, uh, a slim hub and not what we call a fat hub. A slim hub is only containing data. It will not contain business rules. And the reason for that is because it's easier to maintain, it's easier to apply, and it's easier to extract data from and is more stable. So that hub is connected to the, uh, to the application providers and the application providers will have the business rules on their side. And then there's the controlling side on the uh, right hand that is integrated to the hub. So the hub becomes the center point and bridging, you can say a supply and the demand side, creating data. So how do we use this data? If you look at the parking inventory, the supply side, it's a matter of understanding the nature of your asset. And that again is a matter of understanding what does my parking inventory actually look like? How many parking spots do I have? Where do they exist? On which streets? And what is the nature of those? Are they big or they small or long? Are they off street, on street? What kind of policies have I applied to my parking asset? All these policies can be handicap, EV, and so forth, as I mentioned before. And also knowing the extension. Because if you don't know your asset and the composition of your asset, obviously you can't optimize that asset against policies, political policies or financial uh, agendas. So if you take the demand side in contrast, if you can't see the, the demand side and how the demand side is composed, you cannot optimize that against your supply side. So the, the inefficiencies, the, 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 the lack of balance between supply and demand needs to be bridged and understood. And data is the key. So how do you use data or how do we actually 
create transparency. Now on the demand side, well, this is a matter of understanding the parking behavior. So if you have data showing where people do park, when the, uh, they park and for how long time they park, then you will start to understand what is the nature of the demand side. This is an example where you can say, see, this is a city, in this case it's Stockholm, but you can see that certain streets are red, certain cities are black and some are uh, yellow. And obviously by nature, the black ones are the ones that are inaccessible simply because the, there's a parking congestion in place. We've that in two minutes. Uh, thanks. I will make it in time, thanks. So here you can actually go and say, how can I optimize this? And how can I turn the black ones into red ones or green ones? And when you have a transparency on the operational part, sorry, on the demand side and the supply side, you can start to optimize that. And you will do that against your policies. So you can start to measure how much do I make? What is my, uh, my earnings? Can I improve my earnings? Can I improve the mobility by simply measuring how, for how long time do people actually search for a parking spot that you can do by data? And well, how can I optimize my enforcing staff to optimize that people actually park properly in the right areas? So with the operational parking dashboard, you will actually get full transparency on is my parking access being optimized? Am I spending the right resources and applying the right parking rules and policies? Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Morton. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, it, essentially, once you've once you've developed a, a baseline data, you can then see the effect of of, of applying different policies. Yeah, correct. Um, as long as you've got the baseline data. Um, there are, there are uh, three or four questions, I think, Evo. Um, the uh, Thomas Grimswell, what tech are you using for curbside parking detections? I think to extent, Thomas, that's going to be dealt with in the next presentation. So if we can wait on that one. Um, whew, Wolfgang, what does digital on-street parking management cost for a city? That's, uh, that's one. <laughs> That's, I don't think we can answer that very quickly. We, I don't know, Morton, can, do you think no, we can? No, we can. We can. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically a, uh, a matter of, you can say, the size and the workload. We provide this, in this case, as consultancy to the cities. Yeah, but that doesn't, doesn't really answer the question, does it? I mean, it, it, in principle, um, I believe it, it, it is cost effective. Um, I mean, but th there's a question of the, the social value and the, the, the financial value as well, because it can help reduce costs. It can, in certain cases, help increase revenues. Um, it can certainly help uh, actually controlling car use uh, in, in, in urban areas. Uh, so uh, I think that's one that we'd have to either have a longer session on uh, talking yes, about. Yes, I mean... At, these are these are mainly you can say uh, for for public parking operators it's a main it, it's a, it's a it's a question of following the the political guidelines the political guidelines that are in place for for the city in question. Yeah, um, I think we've uh, Paul's question: Are you integrating existing bike sharing apps in your mobility app? Well, the principle in, in principle that's possible now, isn't it, Morton? But um, it's. Um, it is possible, but we believe that in open competition, and open markets, there will always be providers of that. We can see that one of our competitors in Italy, MyShizero, is actually having a full fetch service offering, also including bikes and uh, public transportation. So it varies a little bit from, you can say, from uh, app provider to app provider. But normally this is a task due to development cost that resides with the app developer. Yeah, and then we get into questions of interoperability uh, and standards which uh, Keith, uh, I believe, is going to address at the, at the end. Um, Wolfgang, your, your question, what are the main challenging, challenges regarding integration of EV charging into parking services? Uh, that, you have some good questions. <laughs> um, Evo, I think we could have a seminar on that, couldn't we? We have done in the UK before. Indeed, um, indeed. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that uh, uh, we can deal with that one today. Uh, what do you think? Uh, it's a big question. Um, it's true. Maybe we should have a webinar four about this topic. Yeah, it's not uh, uh, 
I, I, I think so. So great question, Wolfgang. That uh, we're going to blow us up, blow out our, uh, our timing. I think. Um, so we'll, we'll have to come back to that one. Uh, do you have any comment, uh, Evo, or should we move on to the next? No, I, I was just I was just thinking that in the cost discussion, there's of course also the opportunity cost. I mean, the fact mm. if you don't do it, you you end up with. Uh, costs that other other types of costs and and you uh, um so that's the um that's makes of course the uh the budgeting quite quite complex also because the uh the 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 societal and and monetary benefits you would have from the system might not be on your um on your account as a as a city service or as a parking company so um it uh, deserves a, a discussion also with other um, other services. Yeah, I mean, just very, very quickly, there was a, um, uh, a quite a large UK city that bought not long ago um, a whole series of new um, um, pay and display uh, parking terminals on street, and they didn't uh, they didn't have uh, alphanumeric pads to to put in uh, license plates, and when we asked them why they said oh well because they it cost a bit more and it was going to be um subject to vandalism and we're going yeah well okay but that's that, that's possibly true <laughs> but you as you just said there Evo, you've thrown away a whole opportunity to uh, actually uh, uh be able to use the data and okay maybe from time to time you have to replace a, a an alphanumeric pad but uh, so it's 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 quite a complex um uh subject to deal with that wolfgang so uh, maybe that's two new seminars. Anyway, um, moving on, the last um, um, presentation in this section uh, is Peter, Peter Dingman, who's going to talk to us about optimizing space occupancy. So uh, Peter, if you're there, over to you. Um, I can see yes. you. <clears throat> yep, great. Thank you, Nigel. I hope this all works. It's been pretty smooth so far. Good. Well, then uh, let's hope uh, it's going to stay that way. Thank you uh, for uh, for being present here today. Um, my name is Peter Dingemans. I am active as a board member for uh, the IPA, uh, also for the VEXPAM, the Dutch uh, Parking Association. <clears throat> and alongside um, uh, these activities, I'm also um, uh, uh, having a partnership with Monit, uh, active as market leader in the, in the parking data processing area and Spark um, as a, a well-known uh, Dutch uh, parking consultancy firm. So just for the reference and the context um, uh, in, in this case. So what you I know what do... you're talking about. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's not what I'm claiming, but um, it, uh, it, it gives a bit of background on, on what I'm doing. Um, so I'm really uh, glad to, uh, to provide you, to be able to, to provide you a short overview on the various aspects around um, uh, space opt occupancy optimization and to share some recommendations on how to address this within a project context. Now let's move to the next slide. Yeah. So uh, parking and mobility, as we all know, are high on the agenda of the political spectrum these days. And, um, uh, within that background, it's important to, to be able to monitor the real-time occupancy of uh, parking spaces in city centers, and also to be able to control uh, parking behavior, of course. Uh, now, the availability of dynamic data, parking data in particular, is relevant for the public uh, and, and parking operators from different perspectives. Um, well, the new parking policies that we're all um, dealing with these days, they aim to um, to achieve a reduction of on-street parking um, activities. And we see that in, uh, in, in, in larger cities these days where the capacity for on-street parking is being reduced as we speak. Um, also, along with the aim to move on-street parking to off-street parking and uh, as such to, to offload traffic to parking garages. Um, then we have the aim to reduce search traffic. And as you may all be aware, of the, the figures for search traffic, they vary between 10 to 30% of the overall commute time um, that people dedicate uh, towards finding a, um, a vacant parking spot, which is huge. Um, 
together with the objective to reduce CO2 emissions uh, and to make cities more livable, uh, this calls for smart and integrated solutions uh, to achieve these goals. Um, so that, that's clear for all of us, I think. Looking at the um, plan for Amsterdam, the, the, the city in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, this is what the zero emission plan here looks like. So it also becomes clear that this is a really important topic to address and, and deal with. Now, if, um, if we're looking at today's world of um, solutions, then we've got a variety of systems being used for on and off street parking. Um, we've got um, pay and display machines and, and uh, mobile paid parking for on street. We've got uh, different type of systems and solutions for off street parking. We've got enforcement uh, being performed uh, both manual and automated uh, via scan car solutions. We've got um, the more traditional parking guidance systems and we've got uh, single space detection solutions. Um, now the level of integration between these individual systems um, in, in the current form is um, varies really between none to some level of integration. And in uh, looking at parking guidance solutions in, in general, then most of these systems, they only interface with uh, off-street parking facilities where on-street isn't integrated uh, within the, the, most of the current solutions. And um, uh, next to this, the relevance of, of, of these type of parking, the traditional parking guidance systems is often also argued because the information that is available is only being shared uh, when drivers are already within the city. Um, and the level of accuracy of these of the data that is being shared is also not always as it as it should be. Now, um, being able to to control and understand what's happening in this area, um, there are uh, it, it's important to be able to aggregate the sensor or the data from from these individual spaces and to aggregate that data into uh, into to useful insights and. Um, well, that this is really getting more and more important these days. And, um, and not only from a parking operations perspective, but also to provide better information to drivers throughout the city uh, during their last mile uh, journey towards the destination. Now, um, for, for the integration and um, real-time occupancy of individual base, there are different technologies and solutions available. Um, and they, they will get you a better understanding of what's happening. And without going in too much detail here, uh, we don't have the time for that, uh, maybe in, in some other sessions, but uh, we can determine two types of sensor-based solutions that can be deployed. We've got in-ground sensors and we've got camera or vision-based sensors. Now, um, the, uh, the sensor-based systems, they, they have got some advantages to provide uh, dynamic single space occupancy information. Both types are available in different uh, forms and, and uh, configurations. They all have their own characteristics and pros and cons. Um, and, and, and they're also often referred to as IoT uh, sensors. Typical differences between those solutions, they um, are around the accuracy, the responsiveness, and the added value for, for camera-based technologies. Um, uh, are also evident, of course, because they are able to capture license plate uh, information, license plate data. Um, also, the combination of artificial intelligence provides the uh, advantage to perform under uh, various conditions and to be able to alert on specific situations. So think of loading zones, etc. Um, at the other end, the, the, there's also data privacy uh, and security aspects to be dealt with, um, especially in combination with camera-based solutions, of course. Well, next to, to these, this category of more stationary sensor-based solutions, there is, there's another category of solutions uh, that is being used for, uh, for space availability insights. And here we, we have to distinguish the difference between using real-time dynamic data and the use of historical uh, data, which is often uh, used in combination with probability map-based space detection. Um, also in the combination with this, this solution or technology, uh, predictive techniques are used to provide a rough indication of the parking availability, which is then being displayed in, um, in colors, uh, red, orange, and green for low, medium, uh, or high probability of, uh, of finding vacant parking spaces. 
Um, and in some of the solutions, you will also find a combination of these solutions uh, being made. Now, the community-based approach that I've listed here makes it also possible to receive and aggregate parking space data information from a large fleet of vehicles um, that, um, that detect um, a multiple uh, number of spaces via a single sensor source within, uh, for instance, a car or a phone. Um, and this localization and map building uh, solution is also used as a technique uh, in combination with autonomous uh, drive, uh, driving and vehicles. Now, if you're looking at um, uh, the combination of, uh, of real-time um, parking uh, installation, minutes, Peter. yeah, I'm, I'm moving forward tonight, thanks. Um, then it's, a, it's, a, it's important to be able to combine uh, features like the availability, tariffs, payment, and navigation, because this turns solutions into smart parking solutions. And this is, what, this is what is currently being addressed in the various applications for mobile paid parking, navigation apps, uh, in-vehicle um, sensor systems, measuring and communicating the real-time availability of parking spaces. Uh, and these services will become part of the connected car and navigation subscriptions. And next to this, we also have to be aware of the introduction of um, a necessary interaction with curbside management and UVAR uh, schemes. A very quick overview of the characteristics of the individual solutions, where I'm, uh, I'm looking at um, the, 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 the differences. And it's clear that community-based systems, of course, are highly dependent on the adaptation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they're easy and, and, and scalable. Camera-based solutions, they uh, offer the possibility to identify uh, license plates um, uh, that, that we already addressed and to be able to monitor a specific part of the city center um, in ground and, and camera based systems are suitable for uh, offering a high accuracy and it's also good to notice that uh, they are uh, coming with a higher investment and a total cost of ownership um, well then i'd like to come to the recommendations when choosing solutions that will help you to optimize space occupancy. First of all, it's important to define the requirements uh, and objectives in line with your parking policy. Uh, what is it that you want to achieve in terms of your concrete goals and try to stay away from technical requirements uh, that will rule out better alternatives. Uh, include multi-channel communication, really important because this makes it possible to share the real-time availability of data, not only locally, but also with third-party apps, national parking registers and platforms. Um, this also immediately calls for the need to, um, to be able to secure access to open parking data and interoperability, um, and to include connectivity with open parking data standards, really important. Um, and we will hear more about this later uh, during the, the webinar. Um, another important element is to assure the data security and data privacy, GDPR, which can also be combined with uh, DPI uh, A analysis, which is uh, done on a regular basis. And last but not least, evaluate the solutions on a total cost of ownership basis, because that's what will count at the end of the day uh, when you're evaluating those solutions. So that's, um, that's it for now. Very brief and short. If there are, are further questions, just reach out to me and I'm happy to. Uh, to help. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm conscious, Evo, that we're probably running about eight minutes late, are we? Um, yes, indeed. But uh, maybe okay. one, one or two small questions for Peter. Yep. Right. I mean, um, there's there's one question I think was you know uh, from Martin. Are capable? Are cities capable to work with data? Do you think they have enough experts, data, and analysts, Peter? Um, uh, Martin saying you think this is often a lack of knowledge in the municipality side. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, it's an understandable question. There are um, cities uh, dealing with that, of course. Um, there are um, also partnerships being built with several cities to, to help out on this topic with um, uh, the right tooling, the right solutions for that. Um, but I also know that, that there are cities that are uh, quite well capable to deal with that, themse that themselves using the right techniques and solutions um, for covering that. Yeah, we did a survey as Polis, um, specifically looking at new mobility services. So not so much about uh, digital capacity in in cities related to parking, but if we compared uh, 
the answers of uh, city officials and um, people working in companies that provide new mobility services, micro mobility, etc. There was really a knowledge gap um, in terms of, of uh, data uh working with with digital processes uh understanding the potential of data uh, and that gap is uh counterproductive for the deployment i mean the uh there's a they there needs to be balance otherwise we we miss out on innovation right that's yeah. our our position so a lot of work to do there um yeah i think that's particularly true uh about how how uh, municipalities can actually define what it is they need because uh, it's not just bit when they to be able to get the data and then be able to anal analyze it they need you know you need to have the policies in place of course and then I, and and then specify what it is you need in terms of uh, equipment and services to 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 be able to implement those policies and i think mm -hmm. it's at that point it's often quite difficult but yeah, anyway that, that, that's true but but, uh, but also a mistake that is often often made is that it uh, that functional requirements are defined in a, in a very specific way, ruling out uh, even better alternatives. And I think that's that's also something to be aware of. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll take it from here, maybe Nigel, uh, to, um, to also uh, answer to or introduce, uh, relate what we will hear next uh, to a couple of questions that have been put forward as well. There's a question from Manny, for instance, who, say, who says, yeah, we also need a coordination of policies, a coordination of, of the offer uh, across uh, public and private uh, sector, uh, but also the question, okay, what some of the questions also refer to um, uh, digital, yes, but to do what? Eh? And uh, we'll hear from uh, a number of, uh, of cities, two cities in that regard, the city of Sydney class, my, my hometown, um, where Stefan van den Brande will explain how they are uh, entering a process towards uh, digital parking. Uh, and we'll hear from uh, Evo Park, um, uh, from Christian Kersona to um, about what the city of Mainz in, in Germany is uh, is doing in this regard. And then at the end of, of this session, before the closing remark of uh, Lawrence Bannerman, president of European Parking Association, uh, we have Keith Williams who will um, explain how parking data standards will tie all of what we will have heard by then, how this ties everything together. Um, but uh, I'm happy to give the floor to, uh, to Stefan, um, who uh, will explain what the city of Sydney class has done to link parking policies to digital solutions. Okay, thank you, uh, Ivo and Nigel for uh, having me here and having me at this event uh, to represent the city of, uh, of Sydney class. Um, if it's all okay, you can see my yes, it's perfect. presentation now. Perfect, okay. So the city of Sydney class is uh, located um, in between Ghent, Antwerp and Brussels. For people uh, who don't know Sydney class, um, it's located also in Belgium. And as you can see here, uh, we are famous for certain things like the Belgian fries, sorry for the French, uh, the chocolates, the waffles and our world famous beers for uh, these who don't know Belgium very well. The city of Sydney class is a city of uh, 80,000 uh, people, so not, not a very big uh, city. Um, we are known for the, the uh, largest main square, uh, the Grote Mart, um, in Belgium. We also have the Balloon Festival and um, an iconic figure of Sinterklaas. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the time now to give you more information uh, about this, but this can be some interesting background of our city. Um, we have some challenges. Um, our parking capacity uh, at the moment um, in the city center. Uh, so the city center has more or less 39,000 uh, people. Um, the strange thing is that we have um, about 30,000 parking spots. So you would assume that would be enough. Uh, 11,000 or more than 11,000 of them are public 
parkings. Um, so the problem we have is not that we don't have enough uh, parking capacity or parking space, but that it's not used well. Um, a little bit of background before I move on to um, to parking and the evolution uh, in, in parking is our mobility uh, plan, which you can see um, here. It has two main ambitions. Uh, so we want to um, improve the livability and the safety uh, in our city. And we have four main targets to try to reach these ambitions. Um, target about cycling, about public transport, about uh, circulation, but also the fourth one is the one about parking. It's this one. Um, and here it said we want to optimize the parking space by using a guiding parking policy. Um, so what we actually want is we want to use the available parking space, which is uh, more than enough, um, we want to use it efficiently by guiding the right car to the right place. So this is a good example. Uh, this is our, our main uh, square, our main marketplace, the Grote Markt. In the, this is a picture, I think, from the, from the 80s, um, where you see that the main square is full of cars. And then we move on to the current situation. Um, there you can see that there are no cars anymore on uh, the main square. They are now parked in a parking garage below. And this is uh, the main square where we want to, or we would like uh, to go to um, in a couple of years. So you see clearly the evolution from a main square full of cars to a main square where it's nice to, uh, to live and where it's safe for pedestrians and cyclists. So what we also want uh, is, of course, to improve safety and livability by avoiding the cruising and searching uh, for parking. Um, it's a big problem. Um, and we want to do that by shifting the on-street to the off-street parking. What we would actually like, if you see here, um, a drawing of, of, of our city, you see at the, at the ring road, uh, you see three, three parkings, you see the red parkings at the edge of the city center, and you see some green parkings, uh, which are closer to the city heart. So what we would like to do is to lower the capacity on street of the on street parkings by um, making a segregation. So in the city center, we would like especially the inhabitants and the visitors who come for a short time, at the edge of the city center, uh, we want visitors who come for a longer time um, should have there the priority. And then at uh, the, the ring road of the city, we uh, would like the visitors to stay for a longer time and the commuters. What we have already. So um, we have already made certain steps uh, towards digitization. Uh, at the moment, we have 100 uh, digital parking meters um, where you can pay via the, the app, the application, via the website, via a text message, um, or at, at, at the parking meter itself um, via your, your card for on-street parking. In our uh, website or on our website, you can pay your fine if you have one. Uh, you can order parking prohibition, prohibition signs, and you can order uh, subscriptions for on-street parking as well for the inhabitants as for the people who work in the city. So there is already quite um, quite a lot possible uh, in Sydney class uh, to do in a digital way. We also have sensors. Um, 26 sensors, which we use at the moment for the shop and go places. Shop and go places are places where you can park for uh, tops 30 minutes with your blue card. So it is for the quick shopping. We have around 35 zones, more than 100 parking spots. Uh, and some of them are monitored by the sensors. Um, they check the occupancy rate, the rotation, and we also use them for uh, enforcement. 
Um, now what we want in the future, so there is a procurement procedure which we will start uh, soon um, in, in April. First of all, we want to optimize our enforcement. Um, at the moment we are doing it in, in house. So we have uh, our own parking guards to so go on the street uh, and check if people are parked correctly or not. We would like to see there a change to optimize it, to make it more efficient. Um, for example, via the scan car, uh, where you can work without a ticket. Uh, it will raise the, the efficiency level. Um, we will have a better enforcement. We will have more data um, and our evolution to, um, it contributes to our evolution to a smart city. This is a map of our current parkings. Um, so what you can see um, are the parkings at the Ring Road, the parkings in the city center and some smaller parkings for inhabitants uh, spread all over the city. And uh, to all these parkings, um, we have an ideal road, which we like uh, that people would use um, to go to these parkings. And for that, we need a dynamic parking guidance system. We have at the moment uh, a parking guidance system, but it's not um, fulfilling all our wishes. So um, we want to steer our visitor, our commuter. We want to guide them to the different parkings and especially to the parkings we want. So as you can see, on the pictures uh, here, we would like the dynamic signs who can show uh, which parkings are available, um, which road to take to them. Um, you can communicate about prices, about other messages, that there are construction works, that there are car accidents. That will be our, our first step, not only to a parking management, but also to, uh, to a mobility management. Are we future proof? Um, we want, we want to evaluate in that direction. Uh, so we've heard from, from the other speakers uh, earlier this morning, a lot of great ideas. Um, and I've named certain things which we have also included, included in our uh, procurement procedure. So we want to measure, to monitor, to evaluate the traffic flow, the congestions, the travel time uh, and the parking occupancy. Um, we would like in the future the dynamic control of traffic lights, the dynamic speed harmonization, real-time information via in-car app, uh, integration of additional measurement systems, links with systems of other cities and organizations. I think, for example, uh, with public transport or with other uh, ways to do the last mile, um, for example, for commuters. And in the end, uh, we would like a mobility database uh, with some useful information and evaluation tools. Um, for us, it will, be, it will be important to work very well together with the partners uh, we will appoint. Um, we will have one partner um, who will do the, the on-street uh, parking man management and, and uh, exploit the parking shop. And the other partner should help us with the parking guidance, uh, guidance system and the evolution to a good traffic or mobility management. So let's hope we find the correct partners to, to work with. Um, Ivo. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Very clear. I think you presented uh, the building blocks you have in place, you presented the vision you want to achieve and also the, the steps towards that vision. I think that's that's um, spot on. Um, also, I think um, really important is to see that even cities under 100,000 inhabitants are, are really looking into um, digital uh, digital support for, for the parking processes and the link with uh, with traffic management in, in general as well I think that's uh, um, I think that's that's uh, important um, I think yeah I, there are not immediately uh, questions for you uh, I will check the chat again but uh, um, I just have one question like what do you see as the, the biggest challenge uh, at the moment? Um, 
At the moment, we, we actually have a big problem with uh, the occupancy rate of the center parkings. So people still want to park um, very close to a shop, very close to the main shopping street, very close to the mm -hmm. main square where are all the restaurants and the bars. And we, we actually would like to change their mentality uh, and to offer them solutions that they would park a bit further from the city center uh, where the occupancy rate is lower and that they can do their last mile uh, in, in any way they want. So mm -hmm. with public transport, with, with the bike sharing um, uh, or, or any other ways. We, we also have the steps now, which people can use for their last yeah, mile. Yeah. So um, I think at the moment, that's, that's one of our main problems. Yeah, there's a question from Andrew also who asks, um, do you think that using technology uh, and the benefits can also make your enforcement easier? And will that have an, uh, an impact on access, acceptance and uptake? For instance, also on the use of the, of the parkings you mentioned, the garages you mentioned. I, I hope so. I hope we will get a, a clear view on, on where are the problems in the city. And I think all the data we can use to help us um, is, is, is interesting to you. So I, I, I hope so, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. We leave it at this. Uh, I want to point out a question of Wolfgang to Keith, who, who I hope can uh, bring that forward in his presentation. Um, so keep an eye on that. And also for all speakers, do look at the uh, questions that are still open so that you can answer in, in writing. Um, we move to the next speaker, which is Christian Cresona from Evo Park. Um, and uh, it's Evo Park, not uh, Evo Park, um, for uh, just because that's my name. Anyway, um, he will uh, present a story that's been brought together together with Niels Deske, uh, Uwe Brück, and Kim Schreiber uh, from uh, the Mainz uh, Parking uh, Company. Uh, and Evo Park is a uh, long-term partner of of that uh, of the city, and they will present their approach to gradually digitize uh, parking. I think it's fair to say, Evo, isn't it, that uh, the reason Christian is presenting is a question of uh, English language uh, um, rather than uh, anything else. Okay, yes. Yes, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear and see us well here from Mainz. Yes. Um, great. Can you also see our presentation already? Uh, we can see a white box at the moment, at least I can. One more try. Yeah, looks good. All right, very good. So thank you very much. I'm here in Mainz in the same room with Niels Teske, Uwe Brück and Kim Schreiber from the PMG. And as already mentioned, um, yeah, I'm proud to do this presentation on their behalf um, due to some language barriers. And then the next 10 minutes, I will run you through a couple of, um, yeah, some insights into the operation of the parking in Mainz. And on, uh, yeah, to their way to become a digital parking operator. Okay, one second, sorry, we had some technical issues here. So who is the PMG? PMG, the parking in Mainz was established in 1983 and it's partially owned by the city of Mainz and by the Mainz Development Company. They operate around about 10,000 parking spaces throughout the city in 25 car parks. And um, as you are not aware of this, uh, Mainz is, is, is the capital city of uh, one of the German states, uh, Rhineland-Palatine, and uh, Mainz is pretty much located in the center of, of Germany. They claim that um, one of the car parks is always in yeah, around about 300 meters reach of the point of interest in the city of Mainz. Sorry for that. Um, so what is their core focus? So since 40 years, um, they are, they are uh, running a holistic approach, I would say. They are fully responsible for the planning, the implementation, and the operation of car parks, which means that yeah, they are involved in, from a very early stage in the financial planning of car parks, as well as in the uh, yeah, coordinating the whole building and infrastructure during the construction of the car park as well as the technical and commercial operation of car parks throughout the whole lifetime. So 
sorry for that. We have some issues with flipping slides. So what is their solution? Together with Sharon Bachmann and Evo Park, they customized the standard, how we say. So throughout the last years, they have always uh, required additional changes to their hardware and software portfolio. And in close cooperation with the manufacturers, um, they were established. One of their most important products is their seamless solution for perm parkers and quick frame parkers, which is called Park and Go. They reach up to 200,000 transactions of registered parkers a month, which is yeah, which is a um, tremendous amount. And um, they have uh, a centralized virtual management system, which is located in the city port parking garage right next to the train station. Um, so what is very important for the city of Mainz? They have a central control room, which is 24 seven occupied. And um, they put very much emphasize, or they very much emphasize safety standards in the human-centric approach. For example, they recently got awarded by the ACE uh, Auto Club, Automobile Club for their uh, accessible parking and their, uh, for their parking for people with disabilities. Also, they put emphasis on, on training their staff to cope with the continuous changing requirements of hardware and software and software as a service products. One aspect that is really worth to mention is how they integrate into the urban landscape of mines. So they really stress, or they really put focus on uh, coping with different scenarios of surrounding stakeholders. One real good example is how they integrated their park and ride solution, which means that parkers or all parkers that park in park and mines garages get free public transport throughout the city. So for up to five people for 24 hours, that means they can use all the buses, trams, uh, trams within the city precinct, which is also one of their main yeah, selling arguments or selling items for people to park in their garages. Therefore, they call an integrated retailer concept, which enables um, retailers in the city of Mainz to give a 50% discount on parking in their garages, which is subsidized by the marketing company or marketing development company of the city of Mainz. It's called Parking House House, Parking on the House. And yeah, it's also really appreciated by customers and also retailers. Together with other stakeholders like theater, cinema, events, they um, designed specific tariffs to cope with, yeah, the, with queuing at the pay station, to reduce queuing at the pay stations, as well as to provide a more convenient product for their parkers. The city of Mainz or the parking in Mainz has always been one of the trendsetters. So for example, they recently opened up the first bicycle parking. And you see it here in the picture in the background. So this is part of their beyond cars approach and how they adapt to the new modal split. Also in Mainz, more and more people are using bicycles instead of cars. And by opening up the Fahrrad Parkhaus, they reacted to this trend. And this bicycle parking next to the train station is also fully accessible. Uh, with digital products like monthly or yearly registrations, as well as um, equipped with cashless payment methods. So fitting into the overall city, um, they always connect to other public services as well. And there are a couple of examples here that I would like to mention. So since 2015, when the city introduced an on-street max of one hour, they also recognized um, yeah, um, increasing demand for their parking garages, which is great because they can cope with it and they can still, they still have room in their parking garages to cope with people that wanted to stay longer than one hour. They recently, around two years ago, also allowed on-street apps into their car parks, such as Easy Park, which enables also uh, a nice and convenient product for people that are not from the region, maybe over regional parkers or business business people that come to Mainz. Together with other public services from the city of Mainz, they recently established a common data lake, which is fed with information, for example, like occupancy data and uh, pricing data of the parking garages. And their goal is also to shape some kind of landscape that can be used by other public services throughout the city and yeah, to design new products based on data. 
And looking also at their future milestones to give a bit of an outlook of what they have what they have planned for the next couple of years. Using that data lake that is also fed, as mentioned, by other public services from the city, they would like to design more data-driven or would like to use a more data-driven decision making. For example, for the pricing of permanent marker products as well as short-term marker products. So using all the data that is fed also by the public services and also on-street parking to design more convenient or more fitting products for all the users. They're also looking now into converting all their car parks to a license plate based uh, ticket list system to increase also the convenience for customers to become greener, reduce tickets, and also to, um, yeah, to re reduce material in general. On top of that, they are looking into ways of developing effective measures for the reduction of park, park surge traffic. It's not there yet. They are still on a journey, let's say, to design those products as it's a complicated measure. But I think uh, with the data lake in place and all the information that is now gathered, they will, yeah, they will reach this goal of um, having a more integrated product in the future. So what is the technology behind that? So um, of course, there's always a hardware layer, which is displayed in the lower section, which is required to cope with all those different use cases, from cash payments to cashless pays to cashless payments, to the acceptance of uh, discounts, as well as yeah, using um, or displaying, for example, information to people about their parking products. On top of that, of course, there are barriers still in place that can be used, for example, also to lock down, to lock car parks in case they are full or to, yeah, to make them only available for permanent markers. All this or the hardware layer is connected or is controlled by their parking management system, which is as mentioned in a virtualized environment in their um, central location, in their central control room. And all the other services are connected through cloud-based middleware, such as, for example, the mentioned Easy Park, use for the permanent parker product, uh, the permanent parker solution or the registered short-term parker solution park and go. And also um, they use this cloud-based middleware to extract or to, um, to export the data for the data lake. We at Schaden Batman and Evo Park have been partners of the city of Mainz or of the PMG for the last years for almost 40 years, I think, we discussed this book, yeah. And uh, yeah, we are proud about this um, example of uh, cooperation. And I think it's also worth to mention that it's, it always has been of mutual benefit. So the PMG has always been very demanding with regard to product adaptations and also with regard to um, new ideas they had. And it also helped us to shape our products um, for, yeah, for municipalities and also other customers that have the same requirements. So thank you for, for, your, uh, for the cooperation and also for helping us to shaping a state-of-the-art product. And in case you have any questions. Sorry. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, very hmm. clear. Okay, sorry. Yes, to conclude. I, yeah. I wanted to mention in case you have any questions about uh, some of the shown uh, use cases. If you're free to get in touch with Niels, Wu, or Kim, I uh, provided the contact details here on this slide. Yeah, or let us know now in the, the Q&A if you have any questions about that. And please excuse the technical um, challenges we had that made the presentation maybe a bit more interrupted than it was planned. Uh, no problem. Uh, very good. Thank you. Um... So looking at the, the questions, uh, there's a question about uh, occupancy rate and the balance between also between on-street parking and, uh, and the garages, uh, the off-street parking. Uh, can you, and also maybe the role that the that digital information and payment plays in that. Can you reflect a bit on that? Um, um, yeah, that's maybe a bit very generic question. Can that be a bit more... Uh, well, concretely, there's a question of Martina who, who, uh, from DIFU who asks uh, what the, the 25 car parks, how, the, how well they are performing. Um, in, and then I assume in comparison also with, with the, uh, the other offer you manage. Yeah. Um, 
Jetzt gibt es einen Vergleich der Auslastung zwischen On-Street und Off-Street. Also wie, wie stark sind eure Fachhäuser ausgelastet? Wie kann man das so sagen? But there is no direct comparison between on street and off street, but um, yeah, it's a typical profile, I would say. So um, the, the, the occupancy goes up during the daytime, and during the nighttime, most of the car parks are quite empty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have uh, to move on in terms of time, but there are a couple of questions that uh, would be interesting to answer also in the in the Q and A in writing. Um, for instance, also a general question like how how do you work with uh, incentives? Uh, talking to retailers and, and restaurants, for instance, maybe that's also something that uh, Stefan can uh, can answer. But we have to move to the the next to last presentation before uh, the last presentation before uh, Lawrence Bannerman wraps up the. Uh, the webinar series and looks ahead to the EPA Congress um, with uh, Keith Williams. Um, and Keith will explain how the, um, the digital parking uh, standard could help to uh, bring all the elements we've heard of uh, today, uh, the devices, the systems, the services uh, together um, in an efficient uh, way. So uh, Keith, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? I, yes. Yes. Okay. I've just had a problem with my uh, headset battery uh, uh, about to die. Um, I think uh, kudos to uh, Stefan, uh, sorry, to, to Christian, who uh, managed to stay uh, calm in a crisis. And uh, I think uh, he gets the award for uh, staying cool on this uh, particular webinar. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, it's always difficult being the last person on, uh, on a the webinar like this and uh, I want to go right back to uh, something Thomas said right at the very beginning and that was uh, parking should be simple secure and sustainable for the customers and very often in uh, in technology simple for your customer actually means complex for for somebody usually the uh, the people who are actually writing the systems or maybe operating the systems and I'd want to add to that um, something that came up from uh, from Manny's uh, comments earlier about uh, you have to be able to produce really good simple information for your customer as well and uh, um, so just one last remark is uh, something that, that that came out of uh, of uh, Stefan's um, presentation which is about behavior and I think uh, changing behavior maybe should be another webinar for the future. Anyway, that wasn't what I was here to talk about. I was here to talk about the parking data standards. And um, I'd like to start by uh, by looking at the complexity that we uh, that I keep talking about of, uh, of what the challenge is for uh, a, uh, a municipality or, or, or another authority that is managing maybe not just parking, but also uh, other policy around uh, transport mobility. And this diagram really starts to uh, to show you the the complexity of what you're trying to take on. So, and and you can move maybe from the left to the right in terms of some of the things on the left hand side here are a little traditional in the way that uh, many cities have been doing for a very long time, um, and enforcement as well. And then monitoring, well, that's being that's changing in the way that's working. And then as we start to move across here, we're starting to talk about some of the other subjects that have been talking about today. So things around space availability, on-street space information. We've touched a little bit on uh, EV charging as well, but that very often uh, links in with parking. And then we start to talk about um, some of the subjects that maybe Thierry uh, majored on around multi-vendor uh, phone apps. Um, the information that is crucial for your customers and even not mentioned today, but even reservation is uh, is also become uh, quite important for uh, for many people. And uh, as we move into the more complex stuff, we're moving even away from parking. So around policies, you've got to start thinking about emission. Parking as a role in emissions reduction, and that was very much uh, on Stefan's uh, um, presentation. And there's been a number of questions around micro mobility and the linking in with car clubs, car sharing, and so on, and last mile logistics. And uh, Tees had a question around uh, uh, mass. 
And in some ways you can see mass um, as being just another customer way into mobility and parking as a way of providing information into, uh, into mass and also providing a, a service to mass providers as well. And then as an authority, um, one thing that's not really been mentioned today is around intelligent deployment. So if, if you are monitoring uh, and, and enforcing parking, you need to know where to send your people. And that is a crucial bit of information that you need. And, and we have talked quite a bit about reporting and business intelligence, because you need to know that your policies are working or not working as, uh, as the case may be. And maybe I've missed out a couple of things on here. Someone mentioned park and ride, which does sort of fall into access control, but many see as, as a different aspect of, uh, of parking. And also the, the digitization of parking regulations, which is a massive subject in itself, and we're not really gonna deal with that one today. So you have all of these different issues here that you've got to find some way of integrating, and you may take on someone like uh, uh, Flowbird or, uh, or S&B as, a, as a, an integrator for you, or you may as a larger city uh, feel the, the ability to, to integrate yourself. But whoever's integrating, standards are really important. Um, and just throwing in some things here, how would we have battery operated devices if we didn't have standards in the sizes and shapes of batteries and the amount of power they produce? How would you be able to plug in your fridge if you didn't know from house to house how you actually um, access this? And it's exactly the same issue for parking as well. Because what parking does is it gives you a language it gives, uh, um, there was a question earlier about, is there a clear specification of data to be shared? And how do we actually know what data needs to be shared? Well, that's something a standard can help with. Um, it also means that when you need people to integrate to actually those, to enact those gray lines on my last diagram, then there is a ready way of meeting the needs of each integrator and a ready way of actually describing it. And once you've done it once for one, then that supplier has got it ready for many others. So it actually reduces the cost of integrating. Each supplier only has to do it one time. And a lot of people, there is a lot of nervousness out there about doing this because, you know, we're going to spend all this money. Is it actually going to work? And there is a greater potential for systems to work together if you use standards. So if you want easy and reliable connections between independent systems, then you really do need to have some way of, of, uh, of bringing them all together. And luckily for everybody here, um, there is a standard. So uh, an organization called the Alliance for Parking Data Standards um, has been working for the last four years on developing the ways in which you can standardize communication between different systems. That's what uh, APDS is focused on. And different systems initially in parking, but it's becoming much more about different um, systems when talking about stationary vehicles. So curbside management and starting to link into other stuff as well. APDS is a not-for-profit organization. It's actually the Parking Association, it's EPA, British Parking Association, and the American IPMI uh, kicked it off but it's uh, very much an industry standard. There are a lot of uh, industry uh, uh, organizations involved in the, in the standard. And there are now ISO and SEND versions of that standard. So when you start to talk about procurement, um, a lot of procurement organizations feel a lot more comfortable if the standard that you're uh, asking to, uh, to, for people to, to link to is actually something that is recognized widely. And of course, uh, SEN is European standard for those who don't know, and ISO is a worldwide standard. And APDS, as it's known, is also aligned with other standards. So uh, DATECT is a key SEN standard for, uh, for many, many of you will know it. Um, and there are some emerging standards as well around uh, issues like automated valley parking systems, AVPS. Um, and the standard is also starting to reach out to link in, so not take over, but link in with other things. So uh, particularly around uh, um, uh, electric vehicle charging, um, but also linking back into that thing around digitizing regulations as well. And it's a dynamic standard. It is constantly being developed to meet new issues and new demands that arise. So a little bit about procurement, because 
how do you actually use standards? If you're going to procure a lot of systems or you're going to produce, procure one organization that might have to then link out to other systems, how are you actually going to define the standard that you want to use? And I'm going to be unconventional and start with the risks because you want to use the right standard. You want to use a standard that is going to meet the needs of the, the people working with it and actually is adopted by the sector as a PDS is and is also used by suppliers. If you get in the, into the wrong standard and there are a few out there, then you will suffer because the, your, uh, your tenderers will not be able to, to, to meet those standards. But if you get it right, use APDS, um, it reduces the size and complexity of your tender specification because you can say it must be compliant with APDS stroke ISO 5206. Um, and it helps clarify the requirements of what you're asking for. So when you say we need information on parking availability to be standardized, then it's very clear what it is you're actually asking for if you say it's got to meet the standard and it will be understood by suppliers. As we talked about, it will reduce your costs as well because you're not getting uh, three different people to work together to say, link into to a whole new system in a whole new way. They will, they will have done it before with others. And it also um, enables innovation as well. If it's clear how a new organization can link into an existing system, it makes it a lot easier for them. And it means that you can be that little bit more ambitious in what you're trying to achieve. So I wanted to, to show an example. There are a number of examples where APDS uh, is, uh, is being used in, uh, in Europe and the US and also in New Zealand, bizarrely as well. Um, but uh, I wanted to show one which I am involved with because I understand it. And this is a parking platform which exchanges information between systems in the UK. And it does it for two things. Firstly, it enables multi-vendor payment. And secondly, it also enables the availability of parking to be openly published as well. So not just on screens uh, on, a, on a roadway, but also digitally so, uh, so that different systems can use it. And it is uh, like APDS itself, it is uh, a publicly owned uh, uh, platform. And it is, there are currently, and I've highlighted them in pink here, 19 organizations, some of which I believe are actually on this call, who are involved in um, piloting the standard and also working on uh, how the stand, sorry, the platform and how the platform will, will move forward. And each of these arrows here is a standardized link, so an APDS standard link international parking platform. And all of the different organizations that here, or, uh, here all have a different role in linking into that platform. So anyone who has a zero here, um, Parkopedia, I notice Eugene's on the call, uh, Parkopedia are involved from the point of view of making the availability of parking public on their website. Um, there are a number of payments uh, organizations here um, and some operators you'll see familiar because it's public and private parking and, and availability. Now I can see Evo popping up here. Yes, and, indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the cold hand in your there. neck. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the stick coming in to pull me off. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm sure that you'll want to know more about uh, the Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Um, please take a screenshot of this or uh, get it from the, uh, the recording that will come later. Um, for those of you who are technically minded, the actual interface specification is also publicly available on GitHub. And the, uh, the National Parking Platform, the, the thing I just showed you, has an extensive website which has all sorts of information on the MPP and how it works. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. And a very necessary uh, approach, I think, to get uh, uh, services coordinated. Um, as police, we are also very much for the um, for the approach. I don't see uh, questions dedicated to your presentation, uh, and as it was uh, a presentation that was supposed to bring everything together, I think we we also can leave it at this, Keith. It was very clear, uh, very helpful. Um, so we move to the last presentation, um, Lawrence, who will. Uh, 
talk about uh, the European Parking Association's big plans for this year. Um, before that, I just want to uh, highlight uh, one small uh, element we want to bring forward for from the side of Park for Sump. Um, it has also been posted in uh, in the chat by my colleague uh, Niklas. Um, we uh, we are organizing the Park for Sump uh, final conference in uh, Sofia um, in June. You are most welcome. You can hear from Park for Sump cities like uh, Sin Niklas and 15 other um, trailblazers in the field of uh, parking management. Um, so that can be a nice um, uh, aperitif to the bigger uh, lunch, dinner, uh, and supper that the EPA Congress will will offer. Uh, Lawrence, I give the floor to you to close the, the webinar also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I just asked Federica to upload the, the last slides um, concerning the, um, the Congress. Um, I just want to say that um, First of all, I'd like to thank this great collaboration with, uh, with Polis. Uh, we have set up uh, this first series of, uh, of three webinars that have been incredibly successful. And um, I think we can all conclude that um, we've got the parking sector in Europe, as we've been able to see, has developed an incredible expertise during at least the last 40 years of integrated management experience related to the use of parking spaces for vehicles. We use the word vehicles and not only just motor cars because uh, today and for some years now, the, the activity is related to integrating vehicles to what we're doing. Um, today, the parking services we have seen um, can manage single spaces, ensuring variable time duration limits, variable space occupancy for specific clients, residents, occasional users, commuters, logistic operators, and so on, variable use of spaces for both people and goods, integration with different mobility choices, variable parking fees, which is another one of the, the levers that uh, has come to play. Um, the three webinars that we have had over the, the last period, the first one in October, where we looked at the future of urban parking, visiting state-of-the-art EU cities, showing what is happening, uh, with a good concentration on excellent uh, examples of on-street parking, parking management. Uh, in December, we looked at the off-street parking management for new mobility services. And today we had a magnificent insight into digitizing uh, the parking ecosystem, concentrating in equipment, services, devices, and closing up with this magnificent package related to the activity developed by our Alliance for Parking Data Standards. Now, these three webinars have given us an overview of the state of the art of the activities of the parking ecosystem, setting the scene for the 20th EPO Congress and exhibition. So off we go, Federica, if you can change the slide. Um, in, 20, in this year, uh, finally, if uh, we can keep on going, um, EPA will be celebrating 39 years of activity. We'll be holding the 20th International Congress and exhibition in Brussels. Uh, we have now seen that we're at the 20th International Congress. We're expecting more than 500 delegates from over 30 countries worldwide. Uh, we will have an exhibition area with over 70 exhibitors who will be indicating and is displaying the state-of-the-art technologies which are available. And we have a top-level three-day scientific program which has been prepared by the Interdisciplinary Scientific and Technical Committee. This is something we introduced 10 years ago, uh, and we have experts from all the different principal mobility stakeholder activities, which contribute to composing the uh, scientific program. Next. Um, 
This is our first CO2 uh, neutral event. All the locations will be within walking distance in the center of Brussels. The Congress Cent Center is the square, which is in the heart of Brussels. We will be having the welcome reception at the Brussels City Hall together with the mayor. And we will be having a, a very interesting gala dinner in a majestic car park close to the Grand Place. Uh, majestic in that there's, uh, it's almost Gothic in terms of its space. And we're really looking forward to celebrating a special evening in this, in this unique location. Next. Um, we'll be having a series of plenary sessions, uh, which will be made up of keynote speeches, roundtable discussions, talk shows, and individual presentations. Uh, EPO will be presenting its EV survey, which will be illustrating the state of the art of the transition to electrical mobility in all our 23 um, EPA countries in, in Europe. Uh, we will be having the presence of commissioners from uh, um, the European Commission and be talking about the Green Deal for the European parking um, activities and looking at the future of parking. We will have a, a special session dedicated to the future of parking in a disrupted mobility urban scene, where this will be dealing with not only the parking of motor cars, but of vehicles in general, and of just how important this, these are infrastructures, both on street and off street, are going to be contributing to the uh, introduction of the new mobility services. We'll be looking at mobility, uh, considering that parking obviously is an integral part of this. Um, we will be looking at the new infrastructures, urban planning, which is taking this all into consideration. And as we've heard before, the importance of the interaction with citizens. Uh, we will be looking at disruptive situations in the post-COVID models, uh, looking at new inter opportunities and in integration. We will also be having a very special award ceremony. We will be presenting several different uh, award sessions for the 2021-2022 period. Um, and these will be indicating the, uh, the state of art in the parking service sector, um, indicating um, what is actually happening, uh, what is being done. These are all operational projects related to new on street, new off street structures, on street management projects, restorations, restructuring, uh, communication um, activities and special technological um, innovations. The next one, Federica. In the parallel sessions, which will not be conflicting with the, uh, the plenary sessions, we'll be going in depth into what has been touched in our uh, Epipolis uh, webinars. Um, and we'll be looking at digitalization, connectivity, and obviously APDS. New business models are coming up considering the variation on a theme in terms of management activities. In terms of um, uh, access to the inner parts of the cities, uh, we'll be looking at, we'll have a session related to the relationship between access management and parking management with the use of UVARs. And this plugs in very, very well indeed to um, all the activities related to the management uh, of parking and mobility, which interacts on, on a traffic and mobility platform. Um, we will be interacting with young urban parking professionals. EPA has established um, a university link um, where we have several universities which are collaborating with, with EPA. Uh, and in this particular context, uh, we're going to be looking at the, the new ideas and the new indications. As Ivo mentioned before, a special section related to the Park for Sump, which will be coming after their, um, their Congress, and we will certainly be benefiting from that. We'll be looking at curbside management, which is becoming the new uh, highlight scene, which needs a lot of attention the new mobility hubs, um, and obviously we're going to be looking at the new management activities. Uh, next. So uh, there we are, um, Brussels in September 2022. 
the early bird date is the 25th of March for uh, having the possibility of making the best of the lower Congress fees. Um, and uh, in closing, I would really like to thank all the speakers, our fantastic speakers today, our moderators, Nigel and Evo, um, all the people, all of you who have been uh, tuned in to, to our webinars together. It's been a pleasure and I hope you've been able to benefit from an insight from uh, um, as to what the, the parking service sector can offer in terms of contributing to the mobility transition activities. And um, there we are. So we're looking forward to hopefully being able to welcome you all at the Congress in Brussels. And as Ivo and Nigel have said today, these first three webinars are certainly going to be the kickoff sessions for what in the future should really continue to become a new series of webinars. So thank you very much indeed to everyone. Um, a very inspiring, interesting, dynamic uh, period of time. And uh, off we go and looking forward to seeing you soon. All the very best and thank you. <laughs>